Welcome everybody to the Magnus Street podcast for another episode. Um, welcome to Seri. And where are you now? In LA. Welcome everyone. In LA. And Osama. Hey there, everyone. How are you guys? Good, good. So today we thought we would. Um, it's it's around the hundred hundred days uh, since the start of this uh, Gaza war, war on Gaza, war genocide on Gaza, and uh, we thought we would just have a check in with each other, have a discussion about where things are hundred days later, and uh, you know where where things might be heading if we can think about something like that. And uh, But before we start, we thought maybe we should mention that we might in this podcast, uh, you know, we, we, we'd very much like to hear from, uh, from those who are listening, any kind of feedback. We're also thinking potentially at some point in the future to open a kind of Patreon feed to put in some extra content. And we'd love to hear some feedback, any questions that any of the viewers or listeners uh, would have for us that uh, topics or questions for us to kind of consider in, in, in forthcoming podcasts. And I think this uh, this could be something interesting as we try to develop this podcast further, you know, based on the various feedback we've been getting. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great idea. I think also we should also uh, alert our, our viewers and listeners to the fact that we have a, a link, obviously. Uh, it's in the description below. Um, the Magdisu Street handle on Twitter, X, and uh, so please send us feedback and let us know how we're doing. And if you have questions, not just questions about future podcasts, but questions that you that you think that we can you know, help think about and answer about what's going on, of course. Sadi, what do you think? I think it's a it's a great idea. And I also think one one possible use of the possible Patreon feed would be to add not just what they call bonus content, but also uh, our own clips of things that come up as we each of us you know pr proceed through our through our work through interviewing people who come to each of our campuses or our own lectures or our own reflections on new publications or whatever it's a, it's a way to be more spontaneous in a sense than what the what the main feed will allow us to do so yeah i we're all, i think we're all excited about it Tim, you're muted I think it's. I think we we should also acknowledge something that we've uh, we've not really been doing, which is to thank very much our producer Sina for all this work he's been doing and helping to kind of produce this podcast, and to to try to make something of it and to try to push it further on in all the social media, hopefully upcoming. So thank you very much, uh, Sina. Um, with that in mind, I think you know it's for this for this discussion about the hundred days. I mean, obviously, we started this podcast, not necessarily we were thinking about starting a podcast well before this war in Gaza, but this war kind of pushed us, I think, to finally summon the courage to start this, this podcast. And so obviously, we've been focusing on this. And I think 100 days later, I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge and think about before we maybe get into more kind of political analysis is to, to just take stock of the incredible suffering, I think this unbelievable suffering that's been happening uh, in, in Gaza in particular, but also in the West Bank and other areas. But Gaza, obviously, this genocidal war on people there. And uh, to just take stock and, and, and think about this, really, this the kind of damage, the kind of suffering that every day, I think each of us, when you go on our Twitter feed or somewhere else, and you, you read about families being totally obliterated, homes being destroyed. Uh, you hear about, you know, women and children being basically murdered in their sleep. The agonies, I mean, we, each of us were all fathers, you yeah, know, we think about uh, it's, it's, it's just, you know, in, impossible to imagine things happening to, to kids, to, to, to children, to families, to, to older people, and, and the kind of fear that I think is is incredible there and uh, obviously impossible for us to to be able to describe but we need to acknowledge it and I, I think uh, we had the episode with Hassan Abu Sitta who as a witness there in, while he was in in that first phase of the of the war I think it was an incredibly powerful reminder uh, and I urge all the listeners or, or viewers to if they haven't uh, listened to it to go back and to listen to Hassan's 
a kind of eyewitness account of how uh, Gaza has become or and was becoming at the time and has become, I think, you know, uninhabitable for the vast majority of the civilian population there. And this war is ongoing. So I, I, I really, I just, I wanted to, to kind of start with that and see what you guys think about it. And, and in contrast to 100 days later, you know, we just read, all of us read, and we were talking off, off camera here, we were talking about the, the White House statement coming from Joe Biden and his entourage, in which they put out the statement in which they didn't even mention any of the Palestinians that were killed. And so this contrast between this incredible suffering that we've been all been watching and seeing and talking about, and on the other hand, this kind of callous indifference, the dehumanization that we also had been talking about before. And this, this contrast 100 days later is so incredibly stark. Yes. So what do you guys uh, think? The, the, it's incredible to see, I mean, you know, as you said, on Twitter, first of all, on Jazeera, which of course we're all following, you know, on a, on a regular basis, just to see, and it, those, those media, those platforms also give access to viewers in a way that, you know, most of the mainstream Western press just doesn't allow for. But to see what, you know, Jazeera always has people inside the hospitals or at the entrance to hospitals in Gaza. And when you see, you know, you, you hear about an Israeli bombing somewhere and then a few minutes later, lo and behold, you see this stream of people coming in carrying broken bodies and babies and children and just who it's just so it's it's heart rending to watch the 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 buildings flattened with or you know when a big bombing happens and you see swarms of people trying to 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 extract people and to just using their bare hands to dig at the rubble and the crying this, this that's something else that comes across you know that that comes across on a live on a live stream, you know, like news outlet, other than just the, the images, it's the sounds too of people crying and sobbing and wailing and calling for each other and, you know, a kid looking for his parents. And it's just, it's so, it's so awful to see. One effect that it's had on me is, you know, when I see children in my day to day life here in LA, I, every time I see a little kid here, I can't but help, I, I can't stop thinking about the kids in Gaza. I mean, every time I see a kid, in a park or going to school or living a normal life as they should, of course, in, you know, here in LA, I think about all those kids in Gaza who are, whose lives have been com at best completely suspended, you know, and of course, forget school. Now it's a matter of, are they able to cling to life itself, to cling to their families, to cling to what's left of their homes. And it's absolutely shattering to think about what, this happening 24 seven, you know, now, a hundred days and, and ongoing and and you know with as the world watches on it's 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 incredible to see yeah and i would you know echo what both of you said i mean the 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 shocking nature of of the live streaming of a genocide and seeing it unfold before our eyes is um is extraordinary and then also in addition to all the suffering which we we want to acknowledge of course the extraordinary suffering, the, the suffering that I don't think all of us lived through the 1982 invasion of Lebanon, and we've lived through the civil war, but nothing prepared us. I mean, nothing prepared me, at least psychologically, to, for this level of carnage and the sense of helplessness from afar. And then, of course, all of us have friends. Each of us has friends who are from Palestine, from Gaza in particular, and friends who've called me up and told me about their families being slaughtered, their family members being killed, you know, and Karim and Sadi, I remember at the beginning there there was, you know, X ten people killed, fifteen people killed, three people killed, five people killed, and you mourn and you mourn, and then at a certain point, what what more can you say after the first five, six, seven times? And the other day, one of my friends, one of my dearest friends, called me up and and she told me that her family, that very close family members were killed just a few days ago. Uh, a whole family with with the kids were all slaughtered in an Israeli drone strike on their car and in in gaza and and she was calling me up and saying what can you say what can you tell me that will make me feel a bit more positive and honestly i felt helpless because I, what what can you say other than acknowledging the the unbearable grief and to say this is this is horrific um it, other than saying that ultimately i mean when we step back of course we can analyze and say you know there's a there's a the, there's as Karim was saying there's there's a shift taking place as we've all been saying there's a shift taking place in global opinion but 
that's not much solace ultimately for the people who are suffering in the moment, honestly. And I think it's really important, Karim, uh, thank you for starting with that, to acknowledge all that pain and suffering. As for Biden's, the Biden White House statement, Sadie, you saw this as well, right? The, the extraordinary, it's not just callous indifference, it's calculated indifference is what I would say. The idea that after 100 days, not a word, not a single word, not just for Palestinian children, over 10,000 of whom have been killed and slaughtered, but the idea of Palestinian Americans, I mean, there are many American citizens, there are many American families in Gaza, uh, and not a single word for them. Not, it's as if they don't exist. And, and that's what I find so shocking about the Biden White House and the sheer callousness of this person, the indifference, the calculated indifference. That's what I find just so shocking. And at the same time, in a sense, it, it, it again asks, it raises the question for all of us, how do we, how can we sort of, how do we make sense of this kind of, this extraordinary horror that we're seeing unfolding and then the denial happening in, in America, in the mainstream? The thing, the, the thing about Biden, and you, bo you both said it, that, that there's a statement that comes out and this really doesn't mention Palestinian suffering at all or Palestinians at all. It's Sama, you said it right. It's not just it's not just ind indifference. It's, it's it's you could almost forgive indifference. I mean, you can't really, but it's this is this is it's deliberate indifference, which means it's not indifference at all. It's it's calculated. We are deliberately not going to mention these people in order to inflict emotional harm in addition to all of the physical harm that we are we are also helping to inflict in terms of bombs and missiles and tank shells and artillery and so on. So we're going to we're going to add to our, you know, to the to this constant dehumanization of Palestinians. So what we're seeing basically between the White House people and the State Department people who are just as abhorrent as the White House people, the spokesman there, I mean, the, I don't know how these people live their lives. I honestly don't understand it. But whatever, that's not that's something else. But just to, like the, the dehumanization of Palestinians runs the gamut from that sort of calculated indifference in the White House and you know, these well quaffed people, the spokespeople and Biden himself and so forth, all the way to the, you know, the, the, the expressed malevolence and racism and, and hatefulness of the Israeli leaders all the way down to the, to the smallest of their private soldiers. And then obviously to the bombs and the shelling and the killing it's full spectrum dehumanization of Palestinians. And it's, it's incredible to see. And obviously, you know, it, it's not, depressing isn't the right word. It's, it's, uh, it's infuriating. It's a combination of, of, of depressing, infuriating, angering, hurtful, and, and so on. I think, uh, you, you know, I think, I, I think it's also in contrast, if we want to do another contrast is, is while, we, you know, I, I don't want to talk right now about the actual ICJ case and the court case, but simply the part of the humanity within which the South African team presented what was going on. Uh, you know, so on behalf of South Africa, on behalf of the world, in the world court. So on behalf of, I would say, the vast majority of the world, uh, it's the 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 way in which if you're going to be talking on behalf of Palestinians, whether it was a legal case or you're advocating in any way, the, the kind of the humanity that comes from talking about the Palestinians, I think is extremely important, something that needs to be highlighted in contrast to this very mean-spirited uh, the statement you mentioned, this White House statement, but you know, there's some European statements as well, and some of the others like this, this kind of dehumanizing, callous, uh, uh, you know, at, at best, at best, technical or technocratic or kind of casual, if they want to mention it, but usually just ignoring and certainly ignoring the the suffering of of Palestinians. You have this unbelievable uh, performance, in a sense, uh, this this very courageous, very uplifting, very humanist, very you know full of humanity and compassion, in addition to the brilliant legal kind of team. But just the humanity, I think, is really worth uh, pointing out as uh, something I think, you know, it'd be interesting to, to uh, you know, is this a global South thing? Is this a vast majority of the world thing? Because even within the US, uh, even within the Biden administration and within the State Department, there's a lot of resignations or threats of resignations or letters or those procedures that they're now doing where people are signing off letters and saying this is this is outrageous and against their... Again, you know, so there's even within the American, uh, the mid-level, lower level staff and, and thing, there's a lot of, I think, opposition. And so this, it, it, you know, thinking about Palestine is to be human. I think that's really important to point out. 
I think that's a great point, Karim. And we have to remember, it's, you're, I mean, you're right. It's not just <clears throat> it's not just people, you know, in, in the administration, for example, all those principal people who have already stepped down from various positions. And there was one who stepped down recently in the education department. There was somebody who stepped down from the State Department. I mean, there are other kinds of people. There was rumor. There were rumors of a of a walkout today by some administration staff. I don't know if that will, or actually, it's not just administration. It's federal government staff, which may or may not happen. But there's a lot of there's a lot of those those kinds of expressions are proliferating. There's the humanity we see all around us. In you know, you see it on Twitter too. But you know, students and people and just everybody kind of feeling this sense of outrage at what's what's happening, and then. Obviously, the the South African presentation at the ICJ was incredibly moving for that for the for the purpose for the reason you just said, Karim. But there's also, I mean, we've all seen it. There's that circulating video of various actors reading the from the South African presentation at the at the ICJ, which again speaks to you know the large scale kind of uh, not just in the global South, but which I think almost goes without saying in the question of Palestine, but the global North as well. People are you know, students and then major actors and that again, full spectrum. It's full, if what we're seeing on the one hand is the full spectrum dehumanization of Palestine and the Palestinians by the Israelis and their American managers, what we can also see the full spectrum rehumanization of Palestinians from students, from faculty, from, from ordinary sort of staffers in the white house or various, you know, levels of the, of the Biden administration. And then of course, across other kinds of spectrums as well, including all of those major actors who, who participated in reading from the South African uh, ICJ presentation. Yeah, I think also, you know, I think that's a great point, Sadie, but also there's a, the, a reminder that the South Africa case, the legal team itself, the, the idea that it's both black and white, young and old, um, men and women, it's an extraordinary picture of the diversity and also of the pluralism that that shapes and the post-apartheid nature of South Africa that comes to the fore and that and 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 all the resonant symbolism of what post South Africa post-apartheid South Africa is in terms of what it means for justice for overcoming racism and siding so clearly and unequivocally with the Palestinians in this moment of horror and genocide in Gaza up against not just the racism of the Israeli position, but also the, the, let's repeat the word, the calculated indifference and the calculated denial on the part of so many in the official West. You're right, Sadie, there is a whole spectrum of rehumanization. I like that full spectrum dehumanization on the one hand, full spectrum rehumanization on the other hand. So the question I have for, for both of you is, because I'm struggling with this, you know, on the one hand, we, we see, of course, constantly, and I know Kenny wanted us to focus on the suffering and on the solidarity initially, but maybe this is a good segue to to the second part, which is to say, the question that I'm struggling with still after 100 days of, of this genocide in Gaza is the following. On the one hand, there's the relentless racism that we see. I mean, the Israelis have not hidden how racist they are in terms of their official policy pronouncements, in terms of their government officials, in terms of the soldiers on the ground, it's a horror show, and, and they've revealed themselves, and they don't hide it, which is stunning. Then you have the New York Times, for example, and the whole media establishment, the liberal establishment, the Guardian, the New York Times, and so on and so forth, all of which, for example, didn't mention the fact that there was a huge demonstration or minimize the fact that there were huge demonstrations of this past Saturday, and, and as if it didn't happen, which is standard operating procedure for the New York Times. Okay, and that's a deliberate, we know, we know, and we'll bring, we're going to bring, uh, hopefully at some point, we're going to bring some guests on to talk about the media on our show. But the idea that these are obviously deliberate editorial decisions that get taken, that, that are taken constantly to muzzle the Palestinian perspective, to muzzle the humanity of the Palestinians, to muzzle the extent of solidarity, and to keep presenting the opposite side, that it's normal and okay and good to be Zionist. But my question is, Ultimately, th th those are the obvious things. The question that I struggle with is how much of this, and this is for Karim and Sadi, how much of this Western support, the official Western support, again, because the Sadi's point that that there's there are fractures in the West, obviously, in the global North, but how much of the official support, the kind of shocking German position, for example, the shocking European position, official position, the French position, the UK position, the US position, the Biden statement on 100 days war, how much of that is due to the fact that they've invested so much in 
supporting Israel in the Israeli narrative before October 7th, after October 7th, that they, they can't walk back. Because if they walk back, the, the, the whole ethical structure of how they think about the world and how they talk about the world crumbles. I don't know, maybe I'm being naive about this, but do you see what I'm saying? They've invested so much, it's sort of like Macbeth, they've, they've, they're, they've, they've had so much blood on their hands, they can't actually walk back. And that's what I'm, and so how much of that is the problem? I, yeah, it's, it's when you look at the, the distortions in the media, I mean, again, I mean, as Osama, as you're saying, if we talk about the Biden White House and it's sort of calculated indifference, right? Again, it's it's not an actual ignoring of the Palestinians. It's it's a it's a calculated ignoring. It's it's a it's a thoughtful, it's a willful ignorance. It's a different kind of thing than mere actual indifference. That it ha you know, that we see versions of the same thing in the in the Western media. And as you said, for example, that that major newspapers and media outlets didn't cover the huge demonstrations or always minimize when they do cover them, they tend to minimize how many people are at these demonstrations. You see whole cities full of people protesting. And it's it's like these people want to make that disappear in a way. But also, for example, the the ICJ case, I mean, people on different platforms, it was you know different different stories were happening. <clears throat> but for example, I know the BBC, for instance, didn't cover the South African presentation at all, but it ran the Israeli presentation you know, in, in real time, which is, again, that's obviously somebody somewhere is making an editorial decision about how to proceed with these things. When it comes to, for example, the incidents of October 7th, what actually happened on October 7th, very, very early on, outlets like Electronic Intifada were already raising questions about what actually did happen. Undoubtedly, there were innocent Israeli civilians who were killed, and that's, that's a terrible thing. But it was also very clear that from the scale of the damage that was inflicted on on houses and cars and, and buildings and so forth that it couldn't it could something else was in play than just what Palestinian fighters themselves did and and yet that story remained kind of repressed in the Western media even as it began to grow and grow and grow in the Israeli media so that now there are many 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 reports in major Israeli newspapers like Yadionot Aranot and and so on, that they, they tend to be, of course, in Hebrew, and they tend not to be covered, not to be picked up here in the Western press. And it's part of the same kind of syndrome in the sense that the emphasis on the, the horror of October 7th had, is, was immediately seized upon by the Israelis to justify their genocide in Gaza. It still is just, I mean, that's half of their case at the ICJ was to say, October 7th, therefore, genocide is in effect okay, effectively is what they're saying. And, and that's not just the official Israeli position, that's been the kind of the implicit position of much of the mainstream Western media as well, to focus on happen and reiterating the, the Israeli position on October 7th. Or, for example, this has come up in, in, our, in some of our previous shows as well, you know, this thing about when the, when the Palestinians, when, when the casualty figures come out of Gaza, the updates every day. At some point, somebody made the Western press insert, oh, the Hamas run health ministry says, as so as to discredit these, these numbers, which the UN and other agencies and Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have said for years are always very, very reliable figures. And yet there's this attempt by the, by the Western media to try and it's this, it's this implicit, it's at times explicit, at times implicit form of racism and dehumanization and obviously censorship that, that that, yeah, I'd love to talk with the editors of these places and, and say, well, you know what, it's, I mean, are you really being that deliberate, that mendacious in the way in which you calculate headlines, for example, so as to mislead, the way in which you construct sentences, so as to mislead, the way in which you make selections as to what's included and what ex Sorry. what's excluded from your coverage? Is, is this new? I mean, I'm, I mean, you, I, I, of course, what you're saying is makes perfect sense. I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, how much of this, we've been talking about this kind of thing for, for, I don't know, decades, ever since I can remember, the business of New York Times. And I mean, this stuff has been documented. So is do you, do you think anything, you think this is a new thing? Or do you think that's just the extent and the, the, the inability to escape the sheer magnitude of what's going on makes it that much more incredible, in a sense? 
You know what I mean? Is it is it something? Do, do you see anything new in this? Yeah, or is it, that's, it, a, that's is a great it, point. Is it qualitative? Is it qualitative? It's both, Karim. It's 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 because in previous moments it could be okay. This thus and such event happens, and so we're gonna so we whoever these editors are, we're gonna put this incredibly misleading headline on it. But this has been the scale of this, as we've said before, as and and as the world acknowledges. What we're seeing in Gaza, what we've seen for the past hundred days, is unprecedented in in the entire uh, uh, Palestinian conflict with the Zionist project in Palestine. I mean, it's it's never been anything like this in terms of sheer number of people hurt, in terms of the level of destruction, and in terms of the duration as well. I mean, I suppose you could say the Nakba, but I don't think. In fact, I know it, not this many people were killed during the Nakba. Yes, hundreds of villages were demolished. Certainly during not and live after on TV. The Nakba. Yeah. And so and, and that's of course not live on TV. And so there's this 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 incredible uh there's the the fact that it's being live streamed for so long, it's to such an extent, that's what makes the deceit of the mainstream Western press so startling in this case. It's like, wow, I mean, even this you're gonna tell us isn't happening, we can see it with our own eyes. That's one thing. So we know so, but, but we know I... that these producers that this just to this point because the producers themselves just write down and send down to the reporters and send down to others to say here are the editorial guidelines this is what you say and this is what you can't say in all of these news broadcasts i mean i think this is this is clear so but but can we go back to the question i asked earlier which is that i mean i think Kenny is right that this is not new in the sense that we've all our lives we've known how how extraordinarily biased uh the the and we say bias in the sense that it's documented there's there are a million studies about the new york times and so on and and the way the way um the way the media in the west the mainstream media in the west consistently frames the the, the palestinians and frames the israelis one is victim one is not and so on and so forth but uh, to go back to this question in our entire as long as we've been sort of uh, you know thinking about this and and reading about this and living this and experiencing this this history we've never seen i've never seen a western set of states led by the united states allow this level of barbarism for so long this level of dehumanization this level of of destruction go on for so long so i go back to my original question why are they allowing this to happen in this way i mean this is what I, i'm trying to understand because usually the americans in 1982, Reagan said in August, you know, wait, enough is enough. You can't do this. There's a certain point where they say enough is enough. Here, it just seems like Biden has given Israel the keys. And he's like, you know, okay, do whatever you want. You know, the, it just seems completely lacking any form of leadership. It's just like, okay, we're, we're Zionists. We love Israel. Israel can do whatever it wants. And, and no matter how many Palestinians are killed and no matter how much the world can actually see this, and and the American position is like okay we'll do this. Is it because they they just hate Palestinians so much, or is it because they understand as does Germany that they've invested so much in Israel that now there, there, there's a turning point and the world is at a turning point and the vast majority of the world can see what colonial Zionism is and what it means and what it implies for Palestinians that there's no way you can't you can't go halfway. It's either you're on this camp or you're on this camp and that's it. Yeah, it, yeah, it could I, be. I would... This goes back. This goes back to Karim's point about you know the. Is this a question of the scale has changed the dynamic in a certain to a certain to a certain extent? I think that's I think that's part of what's happening is that once you're in, you you have to go in all the way, and it's the fact that we see this growing revulsion in the West and and of course in the global South about what these Israelis are doing that we see. That's why it becomes so clear. Uh, the Biden administrations and the Germans and the, the French, who are even in some sense worse than the Germans, if such a thing is possible, and 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 so on. Um, but some, I also wanted to come back to what you said about Reagan in '82. It was literally August 12, 1982, one of the worst days of the siege, which we all remember. He literally one phone call to Begin, and it stopped. He's Reagan said, "You've got to stop this." And in his memoirs, he even said. What I'm seeing is a Holocaust. And he said, I chose that word very, very deliberately to convey to Begin. And literally 20 minutes later, the bombing stopped. No, sorry, the airstrike stopped. And then he called, and then, but the artillery kept going. And then he called Begin back and said, I can still see it on TV. There's still, and then a, 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 little, a little bit after that, it was done. It's kind of incredible. If Biden wants us to stop, we all know this. If he wants it to stop, it'll stop in five minutes. I'm not, I'm not sure focusing on Biden that much 
it, you know, I think we should move away because I think it's not that difficult to understand Biden for, for me. And and by the way, Reagan, you can also talk about Eisenhower in 1956 and how they intervened, you know, the Suez, um, you know, something I think it's it's important to to recognize that as well, how this the shift has happened over the over the years and over the decades. But I think, you know, I, I, I want to push this further and say that, yes, there is this question of the there is this old colonial and old settler colonial thing with the U.S. and Canada and Australia and these kinds of countries and Germany and, these, you know, sort of backing this apartheid state versus the very clear that we've been talking about South Africa and Namibia, all these kinds of global South countries, not so much the Arab states per se, but certainly Arab people across the Islamic world and the Arab world, et cetera. Uh, all of, and of course, those in the US and in Europe, especially the younger people who are no longer influenced uh, by, by the kind of old legacy media and have more independent voices and that are showing more and more solidarity. That, all that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think I wanna focus and I wanna ask you guys, th th doesn't this reflect this, this, the extent to which Biden and company are coming, coming in and defending the Israelis, especially this government where they've briefed and made clear over and over and over how much they dislike Netanyahu personally, how much it doesn't work, how much they don't like this government, how much they don't, how, how these extremist, religious, fundamentalist, right-wing settlers that are running the Israeli government don't suit the agenda. They don't, you know, they, they don't particularly like them as such. But yet there's still this bear hug and this love of you know defending them at every single day. Doesn't that show that the Israelis themselves, it exposes, let's say, the weakness of the Israelis. I think it really exposes. It's showing the fact that the US physically has to send aircraft carriers to the Mediterranean, basically to deter Hezbollah from, from, from you know, joining a larger war, large scale war. They have to send other ships. They, they're, they're now attacking Yemen. Uh, you know, so they're doing all of this, and at the Security Council, they're blocking all the they're vetoing Security Council resolutions. Uh, at the International Court of Justice, they're saying, "Oh, you know, the, the, this this shouldn't count. There's no merit in it before anything even gets said or done." All this, I think, is exposing the fact that the Israelis cannot exist without the support of this empire. They need them and have always needed them, but now it seems so clear because, in a sense, we can also contrast it. With this, with the growth of these resistance movements across the region that are exposing the weakness of the Israelis militarily, not so much on a kind of one-to-one -one combat, uh, but in terms of the larger exposure of this, uh, you know, to, towards a whole regional thing. You can see what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in Lebanon, in Iraq. There is a sense of you have the U.S. supporting the Israelis. These are now being subject to attacks and then counterattacks. Uh, Iran, of course, is in there as well. So there is this whole kind of re regional, uh, you know, resistance access, as they call it, that has replaced the old kind of Nasserist, kind of Arabist, you know, in the so-called Arab-Israeli conflict. It's now changed into this resistance of access versus the Israelis and Americans that are that are joined at the hip. And this is this is a kind of relatively new thing that's been going on for the past decade, especially at, I think since the two thousand six Lebanon war that really that really kind of brought this into a new phase. And this is, I think, now what's what's happening, guys. I think is an extension of that. What began really in 2006 in Lebanon, it's a much more dramatic and bigger, more regional phase of this. And I think you know that this is going to go on in the years to come, where you know there's a lot of talk in Lebanon and in in the area that there's going to be the so-called big war that's going to happen. It may not happen now, but this is kind of a prelude in a sense to the to the even bigger war. And so there is this fear, there is this sense of. Uh, uh, of the Israelis no longer being, you know, in, in when we were younger, you'd think, oh, the Israelis, they're so strong, the 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 Mossad, the intelligence, oh my God, we're so scared of them, they're so strong, they're so this, they're so that. It's kind of a lot of defeatist attitudes. I think this has been wiped away psychologically, um, even militarily, when you see the Israelis going to this day, if I'm if I understand my my geography right, they're still fighting in the northern part of the northernmost parts of, of, of Gaza. Hamas is coming out and 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 engaging Israeli troops on the ground. So there's this the sense of total obliteration coming from above, from the drones, from the planes, just destruction, making civilian life hell, uninhabitable. But on the other hand, on the ground militarily, whenever the Israelis go in and they try to engage with Hezbollah, whether it's in Lebanon or in, in Gaza with Hamas, there is very stiff resistance and it's not at all, uh, uh, it's it's quite even in that kind of sense. And when, when it comes down to these battles on the ground, 
Uh, so I think this is this is exposing the Israelis uh, quite a bit. And I, it, you know, so I, I want to see if you guys sort of agree with this, and as well, kind of to think about the the idea that no matter what happens as this war winds down, eventually it will wind down as as it winds down. It's not going to make this weakness and the kind of civil war in the sense that's happening within the Israeli society and, and body politic, that's going to increase. There's going to be more division, more recriminations, more blaming who's to who, who, you know, who was to blame for October 7th and who wasn't, and is it the army or is it the government? Is it the right-wing settlers? I mean, all this stuff is going to continue and make whatever we all thought Israeli society was before is going to be radically, I think, transformed in the years to come. So what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right, Karim. I think, but uh, I have a slightly maybe bleaker. It's not to say a bleaker picture, but so uh, you know, on the one hand, you're right that that now we have an axis of what, what's called the axis of resistance, um, the axis of resistance that has replaced the Arab states that we can see with the ICJ case. The Arab states are totally defeated, totally in the orbit. Uh, most of the Arab states are totally in the orbit of U.S. hegemony and a pro-Israel U.S. hegemony even as that hegemony is exposed for the horror show that it is around the world and in the Arab world and in the Islamic world, everyone can see how horrific it is. But the Arab states have been absolutely shocking in their in their sort of complicity in, in this genocide on, in Gaza. So you're right that there's, there's a shift from state to, to non-state, um, to, to non-state sort of resistance. But we have to remember, I mean, history is a guide. You, you mentioned Eisenhower in 56 and, and, and Suez. But the, the U.S. did defeat, the U.S. and the Israelis did defeat the Arab states in 1967. And we grew up, of course, in the aftermath of that 1967 war. And that defeatism that you referred to was a function of that war and, and, and the crushing defeat that the Arab states led by Nasser, of course, were, were suffered in that war. So what's to say that, that another defeat is not on its way? Because the, the resistance is resistance, it's not liberation. There's a difference in resistance and liberation. I've always said this. So the, the, the resistance is there. Yes, it can stifle, it can block, it can it can resist, but there's a difference in that and actual liberation. That's one point that maybe we should think about a little bit more. The second point is this question of, you know, the 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 Westerns, I mean, the the US position has been such a horror in terms of its overt embrace of Israel in its genocidal sort of war on Gaza. What's the change? I mean, what, what's the change if the Israelis, for example, next go on to the West Bank? Because we often talk about the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, but the but the next phase is 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 so obvious. It's going to be in the West Bank. There is going to be exactly like in the U.S., where you had states and settlers who carried out sort of attacks on native populations, and then eventually the U.S. government sort of aided and abetted the tra the Trail of Tears. I mean, not the same, of course. These are different. I mean, I have to say, as a historian, these are different moments. So nothing is exactly ever the same. But the analogy, I think, works much more for the West Bank. I think that's where the, that's what's, and we see that happening already. You can already see it: the terror, the um, the, the the pogroms, the the assaults on on this, on, and and that's where I think the ethnic cleansing is going to go next. And so, if the Americans have refused to stop the overt genocide in Gaza, what's to say that they're going to try to stop or do anything to stop? What's going to happen in the West Bank? That's what I don't understand. I mean, so I don't want to be down on it. I'm not. I I, I agree with everything you said, Karim. But at some level, I'm, I'm much less sort of. Um, I don't want to say I'm not pessimistic, but I'm not. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not. I'm not supremely optimistic either. Um, just yeah, there's. You both said so much that I want to just re respond to. Um, one thing. Just quickly on the on the question of the military thing, the, so the 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 Israelis have shown themselves repeatedly to be incapable of engaging militarily with an irregular force. They, they they're 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 very good at dealing with large scale with with all of the large scale Arab armies because large scale conventional armies require air power, and that's something that consistently and air and which also means anti anti aircraft defense. And that's something that consistently the Arab armies have been inferior to the Israelis in, in those in those terms, which of course, like 67 obviously began with the annihilation of the Egyptian and Syrian air forces. And basically the war was that was the war was was already done at that point. But when you look at the Israelis in the Israeli army in fighting Hezbollah in Lebanon or, or Hamas or other factions in Gaza, 
it, it's true, and you, I mean, you both said it. Everybody knows it that they're they're for when it comes to the air. Yeah, they reign supreme. They they can they, they have been. They've been carpet bombing Gaza. They can they've killed tens of thousands of people. You know, civilians. Okay, no problem. But when it comes to actually going in on the ground to fight guerrillas who are striking at them will you know at will there's a total incapacity on the part of the israelis and i think that's part of what karim is also talking about is when it comes to actual one-to-one fighting face-to-face fighting they're they're clearly incapable of doing it and it's not just me but many people have pointed this out when you see israeli tanks operating in gaza like the, one of the number one rules of tank warfare going all the way back to the second world war is tanks have to always be accompanied by infantry and the Israelis don't they send in tanks without their infantry so the tanks are kind of operating blind and then they seal they're all sealed up so that so that fighters as we've seen all, in all those videos you can see fighters literally walking up to an Israeli tank and putting a charge on it because it's all sealed up because they're they're too scared to have their hatches open and looking out for what's coming at them, which is an extraordinary thing. So we see this this incredible weakness, or it's a combination of its strength from the air, which gets them up up to a certain point, but doesn't really help them when it comes to fighting an irregular uh, military force like either Hamas or Hezbollah. But on the ground, they're, they're, you know, their, their capacities are extremely limited. But I want to come back to this question of the U.S. because I think it's important, and this is this is a much bigger question than, than Gaza. But although what's happening in Gaza helps us frame it, which is this: the the you know people often say, "Oh, well, this is an American war, and Israel is America's tool," and that that's a discourse that goes that has you know that goes back for decades. I personally have never really bought that line. I don't see it that way. I, I think obviously it's clear that the Israelis, and Karim said this earlier, the Israelis could not do what they're doing without American assistance. But the question to me is still a live question as to, are the Americans managing the Israelis or are the Israelis somehow managing the Americans to get the support they need out of the American state? In other words, when the US sends its aircraft carriers and parks them off the coast of Lebanon, is that because America in its imperial grandeur sees this as a as a joint strategy with the Israelis or is it because there's so much manipulation of American politics for, because of domestic political pressures in the US that therefore they, they end up coming back in terms of foreign policy in other words is American foreign policy ultimately dictated by domestic pressures rather than as a, as an end in itself I mean we all know about the attack on the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty in 1967, and that that a U.S. Navy ship could be attacked and 30, 32 or 33 U.S. Navy sailors killed by the Israelis in a flagrant, deliberate attack. The ship crippled, dropped napalm, and the, the, the lifeboats blown away by torpedo boats and so on. It's And that the U.S. did nothing about it, and in fact has to this day co- consistently covered it up, tells you, or at least it raises the question as to Who's really calling the shots here? Who's who's got more leverage over whom? To me, I, I've I've never really known how to how to resolve that question. I think, Sadie, that's if I can just jump in here. I think that is a question that we're going to take up on our on Maktisi Street with with hopefully with some guests who will help us talk about the U.S. domestic policy, the lobby, the Israel lobby, the the and this whole very question, the question of you know Noam Chomsky and company who say. Israel is simply a tool of U.S. empire versus those who say no. It's actually a lot more complicated. There is something called there is something called discourse. There is lobbying. You know the the Mersheimer and the Walt, um, and, and also many other people who've made this argument that 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 the U.S. has invested after 1967 in Israel, and and Israeli lobbying is invested in the U.S. It's a much more complicated picture. I mean, and Karim of course knows this because he's worked with some of these people really beginning with the Clinton administration, although it goes back obviously earlier, but the Clinton administration turned over everything to pro-Israel sort of lobbyists, basically, in terms of the Middle East, in terms of Dennis Ross, Martin Indyk. These are people who help shape Middle East policy shamelessly in a pro-Israel way. And and ever since, it's gone from bad to worse, frankly. Kareem is, while Kareem is, is gathering yeah. his thoughts, um, why, why not just uh, jump in on this question of resistance versus liberation? Because we focus oftentimes on resistance and the ability of Hamas, Hezbollah, others, the the, the, the Yemenis, the people in Iraq um, who are resisting 
uh, an American sort of hegemony in the region, but resistance is is mostly on the margins. I mean, this is I mean, this is a, maybe I'm wrong, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mostly on the margins, and mostly it's able to thwart, but it's not able to actually, you know, carry through a project of liberation. Maybe maybe I'm wrong because then I think about Lebanon. South Lebanon, Hezbollah, what Hezbollah has done in the south, and so on and so forth. Maybe I'm totally wrong here. I mean, I think, I mean, yeah, you're right in the sense that there's there is a distinction between resistance and liberation, but I think all of these things are are ultimately bound up with each other. In other words, the the South African apartheid didn't end because in, because of Nkonto Wisezwe, the armed wing of the ANC. That that's not what. It's not the armed wing of the ANC that defeated the apartheid regime. At the end of the day, it was global pressure from a global boycott campaign. That's what brought the apartheid regime to its knees in South Africa. So these things, to me, they're, they're interlocked. It seems to me that when you look at the extent to which the, the Israelis lobby, not just the American government, but since we know this as, as university professors too, the incredible presence of Israeli lobbying on our campuses, which goes, which reaches down to the to the into the finest pores of American college campuses, it's very very fine grained, you know, lobbying and cajoling and pressuring and all this kind of stuff. We've seen this obviously in the scandal at Harvard and McGill and Penn and the, those congressional hearings, but also you know in in day to day operations and who's allowed to speak and you know all this stuff, right? So it seems to me very very clear that. And and uh, sorry, one more element of that is the emphasis, the Israeli sort of panic about BDS and apartheid and what they call the delegitimization campaign and all this. It seems to me very clear that a modern nuclear armed state would not worry so much about its its image on American college campuses or the American media or the American government and so on if it wasn't so critically important for its very for its survival as a continued apartheid enterprise. And that, so that seems to be, that's to me, that's kind of the proof in the pudding. In other words, the British, people often say, well, this is an alliance. And this goes back to the larger, the larger conversation. I mean, the US has an alliance with Great Britain, for example, which goes back a long time, even you know, before World War I or World War II. And, and, but you don't see that there's, there isn't a sort of a, a British presence on American college campuses that if you if you criticize the UK, nobody's going to come jumping down your throat in the US, right? It just it doesn't happen. The kind of, the Brits don't try to censor freedom of expression, academic freedom, freedom of thought. They just don't do. They don't need to do it because the alliance is actually organic and it makes sense and it's got historical historical basis and there's a logic to it that makes it kind of more natural. In in all, I'm not I'm not justifying. I'm just saying it's more organic. It has grown out of centuries literally of american and british interaction and, and so forth so you could say the same thing in different ways with the, with the germans and the french and, and so forth the israelis the, the american israeli relationship is an artificial one that's why they are in constant first of all apac and AD, the adl and the ajc and all of these lobbying organizations that's that are especially these days in 24 7 overdrive trying to literally redefine terms in the English language, like anti-Semitism, trying to rewrite the dictionary, trying to stifle dissent, trying to crush any kind of criticism of the Israeli state. Why would they need to bother with all this if it was also natural and normal for there to be this Israeli-American alliance? You see, that's that's what I'm saying. That To me, that's evidence of the fact that this is a fabricated construction. It's not organic. It's not natural. There's nothing historical in it. It's certainly not something that benefits the U.S. If it did, there wouldn't need to be all of this lobby, in effect. So to me, that's the proof. And I think that's why, yes, it's to go back to resistance and liberation, yes, you know, that, that for example, the Israelis can be compelled to leave occupied southern Lebanon is very important. There's, there's no question about that. That they're unable to accomplish what they want to accomplish on the ground in Gaza today is very important, and it's due to the resistance on the ground there. There's no question about that. But in the big picture, in the long transformation of an apartheid state into what we hope will be a democratic and secular state, that has to involve also America and the West and, and changing attitudes here and a global, again, to go back to things we've talked on this podcast about before, a global campaign of, of civic resistance and to go back to our discussion with Richard Falk, you know, boycotts and, and this kind of thing. So I think that's, a, it's, it's, 
important to bear all of these things in mind. I don't think we can separate theaters of action one from the other. They all go together in a way. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on that and, and push back a little bit. I'm I think it's I think Sarah, what you're saying is is exactly right. I think the idea even in South Africa and other cases, if you if you don't have an actual resistance on the ground, nothing happens. It it may be in of itself, by itself, it may not accomplish things all the time. Uh, South Lebanon certainly was liberated with an actual resistance force, without which pretty certain the Israelis would either be in South Lebanon or have, you know, have the kind of control uh, over South Lebanon and over Lebanon as a whole, you know, even politically through a f so-called friendly government or whatever. I, I think I think resistance has a very particular role that needs to be supplemented with this kind of global solidarity and global pressure and boycotts and everything like this. I think that's true. But I want to I want to push a, a you know something two threads that I think we're having, which go together, but also can be contradictory. And I think you know I think we're going to have I think we've agreed to have a, a whole kind of episode on Lebanon because I think it's a very particular, and not just Lebanon as Lebanon, but the kind of resistance that happens in Lebanon, Hezbollah, you know, all of this. But I, I think these are two streams that we need to keep in mind. One is this this the South Africa example. I think makes sense. When it comes to solidarity, when it comes to boycott, when it comes to the discussion of apartheid and how to resist this, and you know how do we, how does one kind of push together a, a kind of a one area where everybody is equal and there's no racial discrimination and no you know second class citizens, all of this. But the reality as well that we need to acknowledge is that the the actual resistance that's taking place is led outside of Palestine. I mean now Gaza, it's showing that Hamas has now. Has is now able for the to to kind of or has been for the past few years, but now clearly able to fight its own resistance inside Palestine, West Bank. That hasn't happened at all. Uh, this is happening, but it needs to be acknowledged that regionally, Hezbollah. Now we see in Yemen uh, what's going on in Iraq and other places. We see this this axis of resistance, which is the real focal point for full resistance, and that comes with Hamas being part of this. This this axis of resistance, and this is something we need to think about. I don't know. This axis of resistance doesn't just want to have a let's all get together and, and come up with something, you know, for all of us to be, you know, sit together and live together kind of thing. Not necessarily. So that military resistance, the, the, the material resistance that's happening, is not the same thing as what the South Africans wanted to, but by the time you know the kind of consensus emerged and Nelson Mandela comes out, it's a different, there are different objectives. And so in Lebanon, when we're talking about the possibility of the great war that, that's been that's been looming in the horizon since 2006, when it became clear that Hezbollah could not be just defeated, just like now Hamas cannot be defeated as such, Hezbollah certainly couldn't be defeated and has grown in, in, in big orders of magnitude since then. Uh, it's not to say that the Israelis, if there was a big war, cannot destroy all of Lebanon. Of course they can, but Hezbollah is going to, it's not going to just be defeated. It's going to also... You know the whole region will 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 suffer tremendously in and and in that kind of way. But what Hezbollah wants is not necessarily what maybe somebody in the West Bank wants, or what the global solidarity people in the United States or Europe want. It's a different objective, and that's something I think we need to keep in mind. So yes, you have the resistances on the ground. Yes, you have global solidarity in South Africa. Those needed to go together to to eventually oust the apartheid regime and create a post-apartheid. Society, which is not, you know, which has its, which, which of course has all sorts of problems, but at least, at least it's it's in that kind of realm of a, a kind of, you know, constitutionally and legally and socially, there's no more discrimination going on. Although there's a lot of problems that that continue. Here you have the resistance, the physical resistance, the material resistance, is separated from these global solidarity movements. They 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 coincide at certain levels. Now the pressure on the Israelis. The, the the kind of the, the Israeli expo the Israelis exposing themselves as genocidal as extreme right wing sectors religious fundamentalists who are running the show uh, I think this is clear it's drawn out their their supporters in in the German leaders the in you know, Biden in, in, in personally uh, the British some of these others that are kind of you know gone all in it's exposed them and it's going to it's going to weaken them. And it's going to weaken all of those entities that have come out in, in staunch favor of the Israelis in the middle of a genocide. But the resistances to that want something else. And I think we need to kind of think about, take that actually seriously. It's not, 
the, the South Africa thing goes only so far. Here we have two separate things that coincide at certain levels, but also have different objectives and different desires at the end of it. And that's true in Lebanon. I mean, we have debates here all the time, you know, what, what is Hezbollah, the resistance? And what is Hezbollah, the kind of parochial Lebanese political party that's, you know, just as, you know, it's, it's part of the messed up economy and the messed up society and the messed up politics that we have here in which everything has just kind of reached a standstill. It's, you, know, it's, it's, you know, what is that versus what is it as a resistance? Completely separate levels. It's this incredible military security apparatus, which is incredibly professional, incredibly successful and effective and secretive and able to hold despite all the attempts to, to, to sabotage and to you know spy, etc. And then you have Hezbollah, the, the kind of low level political party that doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't even have a development or an economic or financial strategy or plan <laughs> as far as Lebanon is concerned. So, you know, I think these things we need to, it's just, you know, we don't have time to, to, to delve into this too much. I, we should have a whole episode, but I, I want to point out that these things are not the same perhaps as they were in South Africa or some of these other struggles. Yeah, I think I want to. I want to. I, I agree with Kedim. Actually, I'm. I'm much more on 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 this idea that there's two streams, or two forms of resistance, or two worlds of resistance. One is, of course, the 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 global solidarity, which is going to increase massively as a result of the genocide in Gaza. No question. And you see that, and the, and the the fact that the South Africans were at the ICJ, confirms the this. Uh, you know what Sadi was saying earlier that there's this extraordinary, um, rehumanization of the Palestinians. That that it's 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 it seems to me is is overwhelming and undeniable that there's a stream of resistance, and solidarity that is global, but I agree with Karim that 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 the South African example only goes so far, it only goes so far because um, Karim is right there is an axis of military resistance on the ground, that is in a sense completely I don't know if it's completely disconnected from the global solidarity it just it operates in a parallel stream. It operates in a parallel stream, and it and it and the question, of course, then Karim and Sadi is, you know, is we need to wrap soon. the The question is for us is what would happen, you know, as we think forward after a hundred days of horror in Gaza, and hopefully to the Palestinians now are in survival mode more than anything else. They're in survival mode in Gaza and in the West Bank. It's about surviving, holding on, because as you said, Karim, without a resistance on the ground, forget it. But also without people on the ground, forget it as well. And that's the crucial part. And that's what the Israelis understand too. They understand all too well. But what if, if we're, since we're, we're talking now in, in, in the hypotheticals as academics, there is this, there is, and as people who care deeply, there is this question of two streams, but ultimately there may well be a Palestinian leadership that emerges that's able to link these two streams together. That I think is where everything changes. Kerim doesn't is not convinced. But I, I really think that that's that's I think I think that's what's happened here. I mean Hamas has emerged interestingly, you know, nobody took Hamas seriously before this war. Nobody took Hamas seriously. Everyone talked about Hezbollah. Everyone talked about Hezbollah. Everyone talked about Hezbollah. Nobody took Hamas seriously. Hamas has emerged um Hamas has has is and, and of course it's not about you know we don't have a position on you know it's 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 but we're just analyzing here. Hamas itself has emerged as the spokesman, whether we like it or not, it has emerged as a spokesman in a way that the Fatah and the PLO has gone completely. So if something was to emerge, that actually some leadership, whether it's in the Palestinian exile, whether it's on the ground in Palestine, whether it's in the West Bank, whether it's in Gaza, that emerges as able to unify two streams, the global stream and the resistance stream, what then? That's what I think going forward. I, I don't know, somehow, I don't know that they need to be unified. I think that these no. things operate kind of independently of each other. And, you know, one ha is if more effective at certain moments and the other is more effective at other moments. And I think what we need is a vision of what would be like, you know, what would we as as a collective, what is our vision for what a state is that we that we'd want to live in, right? And so I think but that's Sadi, where it's... But, that's, that's, but sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we're not in, like, it's not for us to, and in the end, it's people on the ground who ultimately somehow, decide, know, but, right? Yes, but my point is that these kinds of struggles are determined by all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, right? So, I mean, yes, the armed resistance is an important, obviously, and it's important element because it's applying pressure in a certain kind of way, but that doesn't mean that political authority and political vision needs to be ceded to those operations either, right? There's, there's, there are ways of yoking together different kinds of elements 
that give us a different perspective on what you know, on on what the outcome is like and i think that's that's also very important it also seems to me yeah no i i want i actually just want to push this point and and and, and see your response because you like like all of us you know but you you've written you've written a, a book on 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 Palestine that deals that dealt a lot with, for example, the Oslo, the, the the sort of Oslo, the you know what happened, the result of Oslo and the logic of Oslo, and you know, and the question is, if if we know that one of the main objectives of Oslo was to divide up the Palestinian polity and society, and create what ultimately happened, which is you sort of Gaza on one hand. West Bank and West Bank itself divided into into I don't know how many different cantons and Bantustans and areas, separated from Jerusalem, separated from inside forty eight, all of this, right? So if that was one of the objectives, and now we're saying, okay, what what happened in this you know during this war is it it returned the question of Palestine back to the center, not just of not just, uh, you know, actually within global politics itself, and we see everybody from Biden onwards, from the Russians, at the Security Council, at the International Court of Justice, at the International Criminal Court, all, all of this but General Assembly, all of these bodies are now dealing with Palestine as the number one agenda. Uh, the, the questions of genocide, questions of, you know, all this stuff is, is coming about. And all of this was triggered by these events that began with this, this October 7th events and this incredible an overwhelming genocidal Israeli reaction to all of this, right? So now what we're saying is that is now that it's back into the search. So the question that we're trying to, and you know, maybe we should end on this because I think we need to have a, a, also another episode just on this question, which is how does one think about trying to negate that Oslo obstacle, which is to divide Palestinian leadership, divide Palestinian society? And we haven't even mentioned the refugees that are outside. And and create what needs to happen. What 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 I think all of us and certainly most people are calling for, which is a reunification of Palestinian leadership in a way that is able to take to leverage, in a sense, the gains, the political gains of what's going on, and not have this genocide and this incredible suffering, especially in Gaza, but also the West Bank now. To go for, for nothing, you know, to have it come back to some American style, uh, American, Egyptian, Saudi, you know, Israeli style. Oh, let's let's re-engage in some kind of sham to you know peace process thing. You know, we go back to that kind of language, uh, and 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 you know, bring back uh, the PA from the dead from from some kind of you know coma that it's been living in, and instead reinvigorate. Some people are saying let's reinvigorate the PLO. That's been coming for a long time. We've been hearing this for quite a long time that the PLO needs to be reopened, Hamas needs to be integrated into the PLO, uh, that the, the, it needs to become, you know, opened again and has to be reformed and its governance structure, re, you know, bit newer, younger people coming through, etc. all of these different things, and come up with a, with a Palestinian leadership that's able to unify all these different segments into something that can then have a political strategy that doesn't just rely on military resistance, but that has a political strategy where they, okay, what you know, what do Palestinians want to live in? What is the society they want to live in? Because I think most Palestinians may not want to live in a Hamas-style society as well. So there's the Hamas that, as a resistance on the ground, but there's also a Hamas uh, uh, that has a social and political vision that I think many Palestinians necessarily don't want to live in. So who, what what is that political structure that's going to open this up and have and have the debate. Maybe people do want to live in a, in a Hamas-style society. I don't think so, but maybe maybe they do. But that's not going to be decided until there's there's a way in which these different political groups and leaderships can come together into one structure and have that in a very open way, and then see how the the Palestinian body politic, including refugees outside, including exiles outside, can have a can have a say in this. And isn't that what the PLO is supposed to be all about? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, Karim. I agree with everything you said. But you know, ultimately, the the tragedy, of course, of, right now is survival. So all, everything else is kind of you know yeah. just 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 we're we're spec it's speculation. Well, it's survival and resistance. I mean, it's, it's survival cool. and okay. resistance. We're but, but back to this, uh... yeah, but but in insofar as we're talking about survival and resistance, and I keep thinking about Sadi's point about global resistance, 
and a vision that that all of us, the three of us, I know the three of us, you know, we're secular humanists. We really believe powerfully in the idea of of justice and equality, you know, irrespective of anyone's religion and faith and so on and so forth. You know, this is the way we were raised. This is what we believe profoundly. But in the end, you know, it's not what we think and it's not what we actually want or desire. Ultimately, it's the people who are on the ground who decide everything. It's their being on the ground that decides everything. It's their endurance. It's their survival. It's their ability to resist. It's their ability to withstand this catastrophe. You're saying, no, I'm just saying that, that ultimately it's sort of, I find it almost a it, it's it's a it's a no. theoretical it's a theoretical discussion for us to have what kind of society should the Palestinians have in the future first let them survive but insofar as they survive that is going to have huge implications on what kind of society you're going to have in the future is my point that's my that's what I'm trying to say without yes, saying what we without yeah Sadie, go ahead yeah I mean look a, a big part of this is I mean yeah I see what you're saying but let's let's be clear about a couple of things first of all this people on the ground they're suffering i you know there's um, my experience is nothing like their experience i you know what they're going through is unimaginable to me and i've experienced a tiny fraction of what they've experienced we've all experienced that in the war in lebanon and the siege of Beirut. there's nothing compared to what people in gaza are going through right now obviously that goes without saying or the people in the west bank who can't who can't leave their houses or have to go through the endless harassment and the checkpoints and the israelis and these insane people with guns and all that we've been through nothing like that but there's a few things that need that I really want to say here. One thing I want to say is that the largest single body of Palestinians are those in exile, not people on the ground. And therefore, if we want to think about what a political, what a Palestinian political future looks like, we have to take into account we can't just give primacy to those on the ground because most Palestinians aren't on the ground, and that's kind of the whole point of the question of Palestine. That needs to be taken into account too. We need a kind of a vision that can address all Palestinians not just those living under the incredibly dire circumstances of occupation, which produces a certain certain set of ideological you know, results as a result of, of the circumstances that they're living in. This is, again, this is like, this is sociology 101. It's not a particularly complicated way of thinking about things. So we need to be wider in our perspective rather than ceding everything to those on the ground. Yes, they're on the ground, but we're also Palestinians. And I'm not any, I'm not special. None of us are special, but there's the Palestinian people, there's a, it's a much wider, much more diverse body of people than merely those who are, with all due respect, with all due recognition of their suffering and everything else on the ground. The whole point about the question of Palestine is that there was an ethnic cleansing and expulsion of the people in 1948. And, and it, it tends, to, it often, all through Oslo, the whole point about the two-state solution is forget those refugees and those in exile. I'm not going to forget the refugees. I'm not saying you are. But don't overlook the refugees and those in exile because they are just as Palestinian as the Palestinians suffering right now in Gaza. One reason we feel so strongly about what's happening in Gaza is that these are our people too, right? There's, a, there's something that binds us with them. So let's not lose sight of that. Let's come back to this question about the PLO and the kind of umbrella. What could something look like? What could remember back in the 19, in the 1970s and 80s when our uncle Edward was so influential? In Palestine, there was a thing called the Palestine National Congress. What happened to that organization? I mean, I think it exists somewhere on some shelf and some somewhere in Ramallah or whatever, but maybe that could be, there's all kinds of ways of imagining what a political future could look like that also needs to engage a, a whole range of, of different kinds of people than merely those, again, with all due respect, those on the ground. One last thing I want to say, and this comes to a point that Karim raised, and I know I recognize this now, I recognize this as you know, the literature humanities person talking to somebody trained in, in, in international relations and political science and government and, and so on. And, and I know that this, the, what I'm about to say can be easily dismissed by a sort of, you know, social scientist speaking the way social scientists do. But I have a very, very dim view of political parties in general. It's a, so, I don't know what it is about me. I just, I just think if you're going to have a political party with leaders, and our experience has been this in, in, in Palestine. It's very easy for the Israelis or the Americans or both to assassinate them, to imprison them, to torture them, to abuse them, to cajole them, to bribe them, to capture them in, in various kinds of ways. That's what the, that's what happened to the PLO after all. So I'm, I'm, I'm not so, you know, I'm not this, this idea of, I'm not saying you guys are saying this, but I'm much more skeptical about a party or a leadership coming to our assistance. To me, and again, this could be, you know, the, the, my own my own professional inclinations 
my own cultural inclinations, I don't know. But to me, it seems to me that a much wider network, a much more disembodied network, a much more uh, uh, country, fast country moving. Run like this. What? Countries are not run like this. You, you, no, I understand. I'm not talking about countries. I'm talking about getting yeah. to the point where we have a country. Yeah, but this, this, these are but these are two different things, and I think yes, you, you I, obviously I realize raised that. an important point. But no, but it, I think it's important to really you you uh, ultimately. Sama, you were talking about people on the ground, and, but you're also the contradiction is people on the ground need to survive. So their main focus is is to survive, and that that's an, you know, we we started the the this episode talking about this, and none of us can imagine. It, put ourselves in the no, nobody can put themselves in the shoes of people who are who have to try to eventually you know now they're trying to survive and eventually they have to try to put their lives together in in an uninhabitable area if we're talking about Gaza and the West Bank I agree with what you said earlier that they're now you know the sort of the West Bank war is beginning and that attempt to ethnic cleanse is going to continue and God knows what's going to happen at the at Aqsa mosques who knows what's going to happen with that and you know so this. The, the 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 fanatical right wing Israelis have an opportunity. They're seizing an opportunity, and they're going to push as much as they possibly can. Especially when the the U.S. and the president is extremely willing to allow them to to essentially do what they want. Now, it, it's it's interesting, just parenthetically, that messaging wise, the Biden and the European leaders have kind of made a point of saying, "Oh, you can't. You know, we're going to we're going to what was it? They're going to." Do they're going to you know not allow anything to happen in the West Bank, and they're even going to do visa restrictions for those convicted of doing something in the West Bank, the settlers and this kind of thing. So they're clearly messaging that the that the Palestinian Authority they need the Palestinian Authority, whether Mahmoud Abbas or or it's, God knows who's going to follow him as as far as they're concerned. They need that kind of thing. They need a minimal political structure to be able to take over. And still implement whatever they want in the in what they're calling the post Hamas post Gaza kind of war situation. They need that, which is why it's not in the American or European interest to allow this fanatical settlers to take over the West Bank. Doesn't mean they're not going to try that, but they're clearly messaging that that's a, that's that's not going to happen within certain limits. It's not going to happen. I, I'm just saying this is the, the messaging. But to go back to your point, Sally, I think you you do need a political leadership. You can't just you know, th things that if Oslo was about dividing Palestinians up, it's also on the at the at the at the level of leadership. This manufactured thing where you have Fatah and the PLO sort of sitting in the West Bank and Hamas sitting in Gaza, and they're basically been made to not talk to each other, and there's no there's barely any discussion going back and forth. Well, that you know, this has to to move forward. That, that has to stop. There has to be a way in which these two main political entities come together, as, as well as all the other entities come together. The only structure that has that is the PLO currently, if one doesn't want to kind of recreate something. That's the one. Hamas has to enter the PLO, and that has to be reformed in that kind of way. And a vision or a strategy or a, you know, what, what is it that Palestine should be has to come out of that. So I, I think that's important. That can't be dismissed as as simply well they they you know it doesn't work and so therefore let's not do anything about it it has to happen how else who, who else is going to speak on behalf of Palestinians somebody has to it's not going to be somebody sitting in LA or somebody sitting in Beirut it's going to be somebody that's within these structures in which there needs to be proper elections and which represents all the Palestinians including in exile and including in the refugees and as far as I know the PLO is the only body that has that yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with with Kareem. And of course, I agree with what you said, Sadi, earlier, that of course, Palestinians outside are just as Palestinian and, and have to be taken into account of one million percent. Uh, that, that again, we all agree on these points. Uh, and the beautiful thing about being brothers is that the three of us can, we argue, we discuss, but ultimately, we, we're in, it seems to me, we're in broad agreement uh, on this point that there is a, there is a tension between obviously the, the geography of Palestinian exile and statelessness and and the reality on the ground in Palestine itself in what what is left of historic Palestine in terms of the in terms of the survival of a people who are now being subjected to to genocide in Gaza and to ethnic cleansing in the West Bank a project of and and East Jerusalem let's not forget East Jerusalem as well I mean there's a, uh, and of course, those who are inside 48, who are who are subjected to this extraordinary discrimination, so their reality is very different than 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 each other's reality and than our reality. We're all Palestinian for sure, of course. Um, Kareem, I think we should wrap at some at this point, yeah, because we and look forward to our next few uh, podcasts, right? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think, yeah, we should wrap and say that, you know, the, the fact that we're having all these discussions about the possible Israeli weakness and what's going to happen, uh, the idea of, you know, the, the reconstituting PLO or some other kind of entity to kind of reunify Palestinian leaders and political parties and others that, that could kind of, you know, change this, the, the Palestinian political reality. The fact that we're talking about uh, you know the, the the standing and role of the United States in in, in what's happened. All of this is because of these 100 days. Uh, you know, coming up is the the ICJ ruling, the provisional ruling. See what what what's going to happen there. And I think that will that will change things quite a bit. I think uh, if if it's if it's rules in favor of the South Africans, which I which I think we all hope will happen. Uh, and and there's a, there's a, and there's the looming so-called regional war, which people should remember is already happening. It's not we still talk about oh the Americans don't want to regional. Well, it's happening. It is happening. Uh, it may not be happening at some massive scale, but it's certainly happening at at some scale that's beyond sort of simple border skirmishes. Which which uh, you know I think we we you know we f certainly feel it here in Lebanon. So I think that's these are these are various podcasts that we need to kind of you know do in, in the in the coming weeks. So just a reminder, maybe to everybody to send us uh, suggestions, any feedback, any suggestions to uh, to the Practice Street uh, podcast handle, and uh, or individually to, uh, to to any of us uh, on Twitter or, or elsewise. And uh, thank again producer Sina for his work. And. Um, that's it. Looking forward to to, to our next podcast, Susama and uh, Sally. Bye. Bye bye, everyone.